Hi, and welcome to the Simulation Step-Up Series. My name is Yannick Chenio. I'm a Simulation Specialist with SO System SOLIDWORKS. So in this episode, I want to provide an introduction to the topic of failure and how it can help predict the durability of your designs. I also want to go over the tools that are available inside SOLIDWORKS Simulation that can help you predict problems associated with cyclic loading. So let's get started. So today's topic is fatigue. More specifically, I will explain what fatigue is, what to consider to ensure adequate life expectancy of your designs. We'll also go over the ascent curve and the experimental method involved to extract it. And finally, I will talk about how SOLIDWORKS simulation can help you predict this very real mode of failure. Remember that this video is only an introduction to fatigue. If fatigue is an important part of your product performance. I highly encourage you to dive deeper into this topic and I'll include some references at the end of the session to help you further your knowledge. So what is fatigue? No, we're not talking about that feeling of being tired at the end of a long day. We're talking about material fatigue, which in a way can be pictured as the material getting weaker over time from getting stressed back and forth thousands or even millions of times. A product might behave as expected for a few days, a few months, a few years, but in many cases, it will eventually break after some time while performing its normal duty. Fatigue failure is a very real problem and understanding it better can help set appropriate warranties on products and help define maintenance schedule to avoid catastrophic failure. To understand where that concept of fatigue failure came from, let's take a trip back in time. The year is 1954. The D. Avalon Comet was the world's first commercial jetliner. One of its specificity was that it had a pressurized fuselage and large square windows. Well, a year after entering commercial service, the Comet began suffering problems, with three of them breaking up during mid-flight. The cause? Metal fatigue in the airframe. The first incident had been incorrectly blamed on bad weather, but the culprit was really design flaws, including dangerous stresses at the corners of the square windows. Fast forward to today, the aircraft industry learned from those mistakes and now all commercial pressurized aircrafts have round windows for a reason. So how is fatigue different from, say, stress analysis that engineers perform all the time? Well, in the stress analysis, you basically design for strength. Design engineer use the yield strength or the ultimate strength of the material to make prediction about design suitability to handle loads. And that's what you do in a static simulation. When you want to study fatigue, you have to design for life. You know, it's really rare that those loads are actually static in nature. More often than not, service loads are cyclic in nature, and that's where you do a fatigue simulation. So since many systems undergo repetitive or cyclic loading, it turns out that all those stresses generated might be low and often well below the yield strength of the material, the many repetitions can lead to catastrophic failure. You have a couple methods available to you in a design for life approach. The easiest, although very risky, is to ignore fatigue effect completely and hope for the best, essentially burying your head in the sand. When phrased like this, most of us would agree that this approach is dangerous, right? But unfortunately, it's very common. There's a common variant to this, which is designing a system without ever being aware that fatigue effects might come into play, which sounds even more scary to me. Another approach, slightly less risky, is to admit fatigue is an issue but attempt to over-design your system so that this failure mechanism never occurs. Despite the waste inherent in this approach, if you don't make some attempt to quantify cyclic loading and allowable strength, how do you know enough is enough? Your safest route is really to attempt to predict life based on as much information as you can gather about your system. One thing to keep in mind is that fatigue is an elusive quantity to predict and there are many uncertainties in the calculation that must be accounted for. So before exploring the uncertainties in a fatigue calculation, I want to talk about the nature of fatigue. Unlike a static failure, a fatigue failure occurs even when the nominal stresses are below the material yield strength. One important thing to realize though is that fatigue failure can only occur if there's tension on the surface of the part. And it has to do with the realization that, contrary to an idealized CAD model, the surface of a real object contains surface imperfection that will eventually result in the formation and propagation of cracks. Even though the macro level stresses, those that you see on your perfectly smooth SOLIDWORKS CAD model, are well below yield, 
stresses at the valley of surface imperfection can greatly exceed yield due to notch effects. So what happened is that cracking starts on a microscopic level and the crack grow with each applied load. When the crack grow to a certain critical length, failure occurs. And the failure surface is typically marked with progressive lines, sort of like the ring of a tree trunk. And these are called beach marks. And they indicate the start and stop points of the crack front as it propagates across the part. Cyclic loading or repetitive loading is often characterized by the sinusoidal where the most tensile stress represents the top of the wave and the least tensile stress represents the bottom. The period or frequency of the curve does not come into play when studying fatigue, just the stress amplitude. The mean stress and the stress amplitude are often represented by the term peak alternating stresses can be derived from the extremes of the wave. Another important term is the stress ratio which basically indicates the magnitude of the alternating stresses. The critical values to note are when the stress ratio is zero, uh, we call that zero base loading, and uh, it just means that the part gets loaded and unloaded. Uh, another value important to remember is the stress ratio of minus one, which indicates fully reversing stress, about a zero mean stress. And Finally, when R is equal to 1, uh, which is simply means that it's a static loading, there's no fluctuation. So the fatigue strength of a material can vary with the magnitude of R, the stress ratio. As mentioned earlier, there are a number of uncertainty that must be accounted for in a fatigue study. First of all, testing multiple specimens to determine how many cycles they can take at a given load will often result in inconsistent data because each specimen has its own unique surface imperfection. So that you're forced to look at a mean or conservative value in determining allowable stress. It is unreasonable really to expect a calculation to be more precise than the physical test data. Another factor that comes into play is that any load in excess of the expected cyclic maximum will likely invalidate any life prediction because that damage is usually impossible to quantify. Finally, fatigue testing is done in a uniaxial condition, which means that the max and minimum stress are always oriented in the same direction. However, in reality, the stress distribution in most systems is multiaxial. It's usually a combination of tension, bending, and torque. So what this means is that the life calculation are much less precise than static stress calculation. So with those uncertainties in mind, the techniques we'll be reviewing for fatigue analysis inside SOLIDWORKS simulation, they're best applied towards understanding trends and not absolutes. The software will help you identify the likely areas of fatigue failure and allow you to compare different designs. For example, if you can determine, using SOLIDWORKS simulation, the estimated life of a known acceptable system, you can use that results to determine if a new system will have an equivalent or higher life. If not, some corrections might be required. Remember that the life calculation of a known system is valid as calculated and shouldn't be expected to correlate exactly to the known life. The factors that influence this uncertainty are many, but here's a list of some of the most common ones. Obviously, we know that highly stressed areas are more likely to see crack grow than less stressed ones. So any stress sensitivity to dimensional tolerances in a hotspot can cause observed life to fluctuate. The more coarse the surface is, it's also obvious that the more and deeper seed cracks exist. So variation in surface finish has a great impact on fatigue variability. Your ability or inability to measure applied loads are directly related to your ability to calculate life. As with static overload predictions, a lack of complete understanding of how parts are loaded or interact with each other represent a similar barrier to making life prediction. And also the material properties for fatigue are difficult to characterize since even tightly controlled test specimens are subject to the same variability your parts are. Even knowing this, finding fatigue curves or a send curve that are applicable to your material is pretty difficult sometimes. Once you find them, though, you'll need to interpret the data scatter from testing and decide what stress levels make sense to provide enough factor of safety for your design.
SolidWorks Simulation uses a stress life method to predict fatigue, which utilizes the more popular and available SN curve, which we'll talk about in a minute. This method basically predicts the full failure of the component. Other methods include crack initiation analysis and crack growth analysis. And these are simply two distinct phases of the fatigue process, the sum of which is the total life of the specimen. So the SN method is the shortest path to predicting ultimate failure, which is the primary concern of most design engineers. The stress life method is most applicable to high cycle fatigue events, which represents failure that occur after many cycle. This is different from low cycle fatigue, which can happen after only a few cycles. The threshold for determining if a fatigue failure is truly high cycle varies with published reference, but we'll agree that roughly 100,000 cycles is a widely accepted value. It might be someone less than this for some materials, but if your part makes it 100,000 cycles before failure, high cycle fatigue method, as in SOLIDWORK simulations, are appropriate. The fatigue life of a component is a function of the material properties and the magnitude of the applied cycle stress. That's why an ascent curve is so appropriate for representing a material's resistance to fatigue. On the x-axis, you have the number of cycles or life, and it's usually expressed in a logarithmic format. And on the y-axis is the alternating stress. When fatigue strength is reported as a material property, it's typically stated as the stress a part can sustain in a cyclic environment while lasting a desired number of cycles. So basically, what fatigue strength represents, it's a single point on the SN curve. As mentioned previously, the frequency or the speed of cycling is not typically a factor in determining failure. It's the number of cycles that matters. How do we get an SN curve for a typical material? Well, we basically take a cylindrical specimen that's nicely polished and we spin it while being loaded normal to its axis. So as the part rotates, the half that was in tension at the front of the specimen goes into equal and opposite compression at the back of the specimen. And that approach allows cycle to be clocked pretty quickly. Basically one revolution is equal to one cycle. So the amount of normal load determines the applied stress. We can see from this first graph here that uh, the cycles to failures at a constant stress ratio can vary greatly. On the second chart, you'll notice that the shape of the mean curve can vary dramatically when the same material is tested at multiple stress ratios or R values. Knowing what the R value your data is derived from is actually pretty important. Additionally, knowing the magnitude of scatter in the test results versus simply looking at the mean curve can help you gauge uh, what safety factor to use in results interpretation. In SOLIDWORKS simulation, the SN curve is entered through the corresponding tab on the standard material library. The stress ratio, R, requested in this form is the ratio of the test, not the one for the simulation you're currently doing. This is important to note. You can type curve data directly into the form, but make sure you set your units first. If you change the units midstream, all existing numbers will get converted. Also, you may have noticed that in SOLIDWORKS material library, some materials name have the letter SS or SN in parentheses. This indicates that a stress strain, which is SS, or a fatigue curve, SN, already exists for the material. But don't jump to conclusion that this is applicable to your material without a lot of research. I typically try to double source my SN data at a minimum. The curve in the database can be one source, and if you find an independent source that matches it, you're good to go. Otherwise, you have more digging to do. SOLIDWORKS simulation does provide another utility for estimating an SN curve based on the elastic modulus of various steels. This is based on the SME specification and can yield representative curves, although not necessarily correct ones. So if you're focused only on trends, as recommended several times in this session, this might be all you need. Keep using consistent curve here and your trend should be valid. An important concept that was alluded to previously is that stress measurements at different stress ratios may yield different fatigue strength. The stress ratio is directly related to the mean stress in a cycling load application. Therefore, some techniques have been developed over the years to adjust the prediction of fatigue in a physical event having one mean stress by using stress data derived from another mean stress. The most common mean stress correction methods are the Goodman, 
the Soderbergh and the Gerber methods. And you can see that the Goodman is actually good for brittle materials. The Gerber method is good for ductile materials like metals. And the Soderbergh method is the most conservative of all three. So the reference listed at the end of this video will do a better job at explaining this than I can. So I'll simply state that the fatigue module in SOWORK simulation can apply any of these based on what you deem most appropriate. I'd like to make a brief mention of variable amplitude loading. Since this is positioned as an introduction to fatigue, getting too deep into variable amplitude fatigue would be counterproductive. So we'll save it for a separate video. In a real world, many structures are loaded with a well-behaved sinusoid. They're loaded at several magnitudes for various number of cycles. So to account for that, a simple method of summing the effect of each stress peak or group of stress peaks has been derived based on the amount of damage each is responsible for. SOWORK simulation used the miner's rules for accumulating damage in the case of variable amplitude loading scenarios. Basically, the assumption is that a damage level of 100% correlates to a fail parts, and therefore we assume that cycles at a given stress can be counted, and the amount of damage assigned to this cycle is estimated based on how much damage a single cycle would have caused. Since it has been shown that higher stress cycles at the beginning of a part life causes failure to happen more quickly than when high stress cycles are at the end of a life, this is still an approximate method. And as with constant amplitude loading, trend studies are still the best approach. Once you understand the mechanisms and the nature of fatigue, making the calculation inside SOWORK simulation is pretty straightforward. The workflow is as shown on the slide. So basically you start by defining your stress problem by doing either static analysis or dynamic structural analysis. You can even do nonlinear. And you'll specify the SN curve for each material involved, which is the you know, material durability curve. Then you'll solve those problems. You'll solve for displacement and stress. As a second study, you'll now define your fatigue setup. And you specify them as either variable amplitude or constant amplitude study. You can even define if the events are, you know, sort of happening randomly or if they happen sequentially. And then you'll set your study property and you can adjust, you know, for mean stress correction, alternating stress calculation method, and, and even include a reduction factor. Then you'll just run it. So the actual fatigue calculation typically takes seconds once the structural solution have completed. So if fatigue is a concern and you are setting up static, dynamic, or nonlinear studies anyway, there's really a little excuse for not attempting to learn something from a fatigue study. Even if it's just to see how sensitive the fatigue life in a critical part is to minor dimensional changes. You may be surprised. That pretty much wraps up our introduction to fatigue inside of SOWORK simulation. So what did we look at? We looked at the basic nature and concepts related to fatigue failure. We looked at the difference between predictions for static load versus cyclic load. And that fatigue uh, prediction is not an exact science. Typically, you know, I would recommend you stay conservative and use a two to one safety factor at a minimum compared to what results you get from the software. Also, we've seen that, you know, in the real world, the data is kind of scattered. If you take many samples that are exactly the same and su subject them to durability tests, you'll notice some large variations. So some thought on designing for fatigue, you know, were provided and uh, we also cover briefly the method that's available inside SOWORK simulation to solve those fatigue issues. I also want to provide a few more references in case you want to dig a little deeper into this topic. So there's a great SOWORKS white paper available uh, on the SOWORKS websites on this topic. Um, there's also the uh, ASM, the American Society of Metals, that offers uh, a lot of great courses. Uh, they're either instructor-led uh, live sessions or online sessions, and there's also some self-paced lessons. Nice thing, too, is they also have a, an atlas of ascent curves, which you can find very valuable if you do fatigue on a regular basis. Another good resource is that fatigue calculator I'm listing here. Uh, it's a free tool, and it also contains some nice uh, curves data, you know, if you want to have some basis for, for your predictions. I hope you guys enjoyed this session, part of the SOWORK simulation step-up series. Join us next time for more episodes on the topic of simulation and get smarter along the way.